So the relationship, uh, my relationship with the uh, American Indian Alaska Native Disability Community started with my uh, traumatic brain injury that was caused by shaken baby syndrome uh, at six and a half months old, five and a half months old. Um, and it just, uh, you know, <laughs> it caused some developmental delays. But, uh, you know, during, <laughs> during my uh, my early school life, uh, I was on an IEP, um, and I graduated. Uh, I graduated high school uh, <laughs> with ten years of perfect attendance, actually, despite that. But uh, what really, uh, what really started it uh, was my involvement with AZYLF. It was a, you know, it was a really good uh, learning opportunity, and AZYLF stands for Arizona Youth Leadership Forum, and you know I've been with them, you know, since uh, 2015, and um, you know I've I've seen a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, people uh, from the disability community throughout Indian country, or at least in Arizona, uh, come through uh, that program and that, uh, I think, you know, it has helped, uh, <laughs> it does help, at least within the state of Arizona. In what ways does it help, Mateo? Um, so, yes. So, it helps in... So it helps <laughs> with just, you know, making that uh, feeling of isolation kind of uh, dissipate because sometimes uh, on uh, living on a reservation uh, within a tribal community, it is, uh, <laughs> it can be isolating because you might not know <laughs> You know, you might not know uh, a person, another person who has a disability. Sometimes you might know, you know, sometimes, you know, <laughs> uh, and I think it just helps in that way. And I also think that uh, it opens up people. Uh, see what other communities are doing, not just within their own, but just outside as well. So it's the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum? Yes. Is that, is, is that the same organization that Max started what's his last name do you know him desiree it's now called project oh god i can't remember the second word um i don't think so i'm drawing Might a blank on it as well so so mateo is the arizona youth leadership forum just for um young people is it for or does it have adults? Are all the people participants um, have a disability? Can you tell us a little more about it? Yes. Uh, yes. So, um, so it's 
uh, it's actually con uh, the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum is actually connected to Silk. Uh, it's part of the uh, it's uh, let's see. So Silk is the is uh, an acronym called the Statewide Independent Living Council, oh. and each state has them, but uh, for, for the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum, it is part of uh, Arizona. Uh, Arizona still can, it has gotten funding for, uh, from them, uh, you know, in the past, and <laughs> we'll continue to get funding from them in the future. Um, so usually it's just, uh, <laughs> It was started by a woman named Melissa San, uh, Melissa Santoro, and uh, Santora, and and uh, it, it's mainly for um, youth and young adults. The way that she defines it is that they don't really have an age limit; they have a stage limit. So it's it's directed towards people that you know who are younger, who are in high school or have just uh, graduated and need some um, supports and resources to both uh, transition into adulthood and live on their own and uh, you know just make that transition. But the reason why she says it's a, uh, a stage limit and not an age limit is that she does offer uh, <laughs> a spot to people who, you know, might be recently diagnosed that are, that are, you know, that are older around, you know, early, sorry, late 20s as well, if they need that help and that support. Thank you so and much. So, <laughs> you're welcome. So a uh, part of what they do is also just budgeting, um, you know, giving people, you know, budgeting, uh, helping them with financial management, uh, person center planning, uh, just stuff that can, um, that can help them transition into adulthood. Okay, and that <clears throat> and that was the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum. Yes. Okay, Mateo, were you a participant, or do you work for them? Um, oh, before he answers that question, because he needs a minute to gather his thoughts, because <laughs> he's got quite a story to tell about his involvement with them. I just wanted to add that from a parent's perspective, the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum was very empowering because um, Mateo got involved with it um, his, um, right after he graduated from high school. And, you know, it's, that it was, you know, during a crucial developmental time period. And it's, I think like the most valuable aspect of it is that he's been able to meet um, his peers with disabilities because, you know, a lot of times in the school system, I mean, I know there's a, a system set up and they, you know, try to do good things, but there's a lot of harm, I feel, that comes out of the school system. And so, you know, youth reach, reach, reach that age and they're not really given the skills that they need to be successful adults. But, the, but that's the whole focus of the AZYLF. And um, Melissa Santora, the founding director, um, you know, did a really good job in setting it up, very much youth-led in terms of involving the youth. They were, they were sitting at the table creating the bylaws with her. Um, you know, she guided them through the whole process. And, you know, and in addition to being part of that organization, they also learned, you know, how an organization is set up. <laughs> and they have, you know, officers and board, you know, board members 
And, you know, they're learning that whole, you know, internal um, process of how agencies and organizations are created and how they sustain themselves. So I think that's also a valuable aspect of it. Um, Melissa also does an ex exceptional job um, promoting the youth and mentoring them and providing opportunities for them in personal growth and development. Um, she's always looking out for opportunities for them, you know, to grow their leadership skills, to um, become actively involved in the disability community. So that's a little bit more about what they do. And if you would like, you know, to learn more about them, you can go to their website, which is azylf.org. So here's Mateo back with the answer to your other question. All right. <laughs> so um, I have uh, worked with, you know, I still work for them. I work for them as uh, the logistics coordinator. Uh, and I've, I have uh, staffed. Uh, Many of the, uh, many of the statewide uh, conferences in the past, and uh, <clears throat> you know, it has given me a lot of uh, good and important uh, tools and experiences that I think have helped me along my. <laughs> uh, along my uh, this process of learning and helping uh, people with disabilities. Um, he started out as a delegate the first year, and then he came back as like a group leader, and then he got hired. <laughs> and so um, that's what I like about the organization because, um, you know, it's the youth that provide the trainings for um, the other youth that are, you know, younger than them and just starting the, the program. And so they can stay involved with it, you know, for, you know, several years while they're growing and learning and, you know, because nobody learns how to be an adult, you know, overnight. <laughs> and so, um, but the way AZYL is, AZYLF is set up is um, it started out just locally, like in the Phoenix area, but it grew each year. It was very much strategic growth that was, you know, implemented. And so um, the year before the pandemic, um, because everything changed, as you know, once the pandemic hit, but the year, be the summer before the pandemic, it it's actually a year, a year round program, but most of the programming, um, the, the in-person, you know, programming takes place during the summer, you know, when kids are out of school. And so it's, I liked what Melissa did because she targeted um, all over the, the entire state of Arizona. So she selected colleges, you know, starting up in Northern Arizona with the Diné College on the Navajo Nation. And she had, you know, a week long session on campus where the kids, you know, came to the college campus and, you know, re resided in the dorm, ate in the cafeteria, you know, did their trainings in the classroom, you know, did evening activities, um, did a service project, et cetera. So she follows the same format. And then she, that was like the first training that summer before the pandemic. And then um, she also had additional trainings at like um, Prescott College. Mm -hmm. um, Prescott College. Um, University of Arizona, mm -hmm. down in Southern Arizona, in Tucson. Um, Arizona State University, you know, here in Tempe, um, and that, oh wait, the area, sorry, the ASU downtown location in Phoenix, and um, one over in Yuma, was it Yuma, what was the name, <laughs> whatever the community college is, is called in Yuma, and, but I liked how she, um, you know, included, she went from, you know, northern Arizona down to southern Arizona, and each session was a week long, the kids come and attend, and it's free. It's totally free to the kids. Um, but, it, you know, the big benefit is they get to meet their peers. And then they have um, social activities. They stay, of course, connected by social media. But they also have, like, social activities that they do throughout the year. 
um, prior to the pandemic um, in the different communities, you know, throughout the year so the kids can stay connected with each other. And she also has a, there's a peer mentoring component to it as well. So the older peers with disabilities are mentoring the younger peers with disabilities. And, you know, it grew phenomenally, you know, within the first five years of, of implementation. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so she had to put it all online, you know, which, of course, made it a little bit less dynamic than in person. Um, but, you know, uh, for the last two summers, it's been online, you know, several different sessions of it. And Mateo and the other um, older youth that are involved in it have been the trainers for the sessions that are offered, you know, during the summer online. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a more in-depth overview about his involvement with AZYLF. Wow, that sounds like a phenomenal program. We'll definitely have to check into that, right, Robin? <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I want to replicate it nationwide. I would take a wave of magic. Oh, definitely. Oh, it's incredible. Do you know of other, definitely. have other, because since it's part of um, the independent living, statewide independent living council, I wonder if other states have used your, pro the, the forum uh, as kind of a model to, I don't know. Well, the places. <laughs> Well, I mean, other states have uh, have youth leadership forums. Uh, it actually originated in California, and like half of the other states do have them. However, uh, depending on uh, the state, it can vary on what they offer. Some of them op operate more like a summer camp. Uh, others are more in-depth, um, like Arizona. And in fact, uh, Arizona has mentored a lot of different uh, states that have either wanted, uh, have either had a youth leadership forum component in their state before, but haven't um, uh, haven't had one uh, in years, or they've also have only states that just haven't had them in general. Uh, some of the other states that Arizona has um, mentored is uh, Colorado, uh, Alaska, Idaho, um, Virginia, West Virginia. So, um, so <laughs> that, you know, Arizona's model is growing, uh, you know, in popularity and in, in uh, recognition among the uh, the other states and we can um provide you with melissa santora's contact information because she's really like the guru you know the one that created this and she's just dynamic you really need to talk to her and meet her and you'll see what i mean but you know she has those kids it's so it's a beautiful it's beautiful to see it in person because um when they have the in-person ses sessions at the colleges at the end of the week, they have like a like an award presentation, and you know the 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 youth with disabilities who are attending it, you know, give like their personal testimonies about how much they've learned and grown, and you know how meaningful it was to them, and that is a beautiful ceremony to see. So yeah, we'll um, um, send you Melissa's contact information so you can follow up with her. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, this Melissa person sounds amazing. I mean, for her to be able to do this in Arizona, it's yeah, definitely someone to meet. <laughs> One other thing about Melissa is that she's always been open and receptive to like just other other people's cultures. Um, uh, at the end of every in person uh, conference, we always end it with a round dance, which is, I think, really, really, you know, special. And you know sh <laughs> that um, you know she recognizes the you know the importance and the unity that comes from it uh, <laughs> from a you know from a round dance. So. 
So <laughs> that was a chair. That that was not me. <laughs> this, sounds, this sounds beautiful. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool that um you're able to also engrave um, different cultures into the organization as well. So. Um, and oh, right. did you want oh, me? Oh, to, sorry. Did you? Sorry. Did you want me to answer that question? Um. Yeah. If you want, if you have a few thoughts on it. Yeah, because my response is different from Mateo's, oh. of course, because I have the parent perspective. Mm -hmm. So my um, my relationship with the disability community, with the Native disability community, you know, um, it began before Mateo was born because I've had a few positions where. Um, I've worked with programs that were disability inclusive and, you know, which was helpful, you know, when, um, you know, Mateo, Mateo was born, you know, of course, healthy, um, a healthy baby, you know, and then um, his, then he became disabled. And, um, you know, so then ever since then, you know, I've been very focused on gaining knowledge and educating myself about, you know, his disability in particular, but, you know, also all related disabilities. And I've had a few positions since then, you know, working with specifically with youth with disabilities. And then, you know, leading up to my current position, I'm a student support specialist with the Gila River Indian Community Tribal Education Department. And I provide special education advocacy services for parents who have children with IEPs or 504 plans, you know, in school. So I work with parents every day to help them understand their rights under IDEA and their students' rights and to help them, you know, navigate um, the issues that come up and also to, you know, read their IEPs and their MET reports and give feedback and go to their meetings with them. Um, just, you know, advocacy in general. And, you know, I love what I do um, because it is working for a Native community. And as you all probably know, um, there's an over-identification of Native children within special education. And, you know, for many reasons, but it's been like that for years and years. And so, you know, a lot of our students aren't getting, you know, they already come into the school system with, you know, um, many barriers. But... You know, if they're a student with a, a native student with a disability, you know, nobody even keeps statistics on that because, you know, um, here in Arizona, the graduation rate for native students, you know, in general is it was right around 50 percent. It's a little higher now, but, it, you know, over the last 20 years, it's kind of hovered in that area. But um, the, dis the graduation rate for, for students with disabilities in general is also very low. and you know, I tried to find statistics for the graduation rate of Native students with disabilities and could not find them. So um, there's definitely a need for, you know, much more disabil disability advocacy training um, for parents, you know, in Native communities. So that's how I, you know, kind of like my evolving relationship with the disability community in Indian country. Wow. How long have you um, been in that position of had or been an advocate for? Well, I feel like I've been an advocate for, you know, so Mateo, he's 24, so at least 24 years. But even before then, you know, because I did work with programs that, you know, we specifically had to not had to, but, you know, were um, federal programs that had provisions to include people with disabilities. So, you know, seeking out people to be in our programs. Um, so I would say at least 25 years. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I learn new things every day and new skills and new, you know, <laughs> I'm horrified sometimes by the things I hear the parents tell me that has happened to their children. Um, so there's, you know, it's never a dull day in special education advocacy services. But, you know, I love what I do, and there's definitely a need for it. Absolutely. I'm a former special ed teacher and administrator, 
So I saw it too. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you work for, who did you work for? Gila? The Gila River Indian Community. Okay. It's just south of the Phoenix metro area. Great. And it, so are you working with BIE schools or are these um, public, you know? Well, well, I work with, um, I work for the Gila River Tribal Government, so the Tribal Education Department. And there are, um, on Gila River, there's, 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 mainly BIE schools, and there's one um, Catholic private school, and there's one public, you know, Arizona public school. <laughs> so there's kind of a combination, but the the sad part is they only, all of those schools only go up to like seventh grade, or sorry, eighth grade. And so then when the, the students reach high school age, they all have to go off the community into the neighboring towns and cities, which are Casa Grande and Coolidge and Chandler and all of the Phoenix Metro area um, to go to school. So that's where we lose a lot of them because there's no high schools on the reservation. So um, anyway, but yeah, a lot of, there's like, let's see, one, two, three, four BIE schools. So do you work with the BIA schools, the private school, the Catholic school, and the public school? Yes, we work with all of them. So we're really working from with the parents and the kids. So whatever school they go to, and even, you know, the schools off uh, outside of the community. So, you know, we frequently, prior to the pandemic, <laughs> would go to the, all the schools, you know, especially the high schools, because I like working with the high school students myself. Um, there's only two of us that do what I do, myself and another person. And um, he primarily works with the younger kids, the elementary. So I work with the junior high and high school age kids. Um, but yeah, we go to wherever, whatever school they're attending, wherever it's located. <laughs> it's so awesome that you are there to advocate for parents' rights and the students. Yes, thank you. It's definitely needed. I mean, I already knew that just from my own experience, you know, early on trying to advocate for Mateo. You know, we have plenty of um, <laughs> negative experiences that happened, which increased our knowledge and ability um, to navigate um, challenging situations. So, um, but yeah, sometimes it's just, you know, I shake my head thinking our poor parents and the things they have to go through and the kids too, you know, it shouldn't be that way. You know, it should be much easier. Agreed. You know, when we get to the education questions, Desiree, I, yeah. we may have answered them already. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking, okay, well, Let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, and this can just go to whoever has a thought or could, to whoever wants to go first, I suppose. Um, so the next question is, does your tribal government have a law or resolution that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities and requires equal opportunities for people with disabilities? Okay, so <clears throat> we um, did some research because I have a twin sister. So she used to work in the um, tribal education department back in Standing Rock. And so I was asking her about this question. And she said that, yes, actually, we do at Standing Rock. It's called Title 36 Disabled Adult Protection Code. And it was created in 2012. And so um, it was, I was happy to hear that, you know that exists, but I feel like there's probably definitely room for, um, you know, for improvement as I've seen in the other native communities that I've worked for, because I've also worked for um, the Nest Purse Nation, the Fort McDowell, Yavapai Nation, 
um, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, as well as um, Gila River, where I work now. And, you know, in each community, each is unique. Um, but I feel like, you know, at the tribal level, there's definitely more work that we can do. Um, some tribes, like um, at Nez Perce and in Salt River, they had their own tribal voc rehab programs. So that was good. Um, the other two tribal communities did not. So, you know, there's room for growth in those areas. Um, I feel like there's, there's, um, I think it starts with awareness. You know, that's like the first step. And then realizing that there's a need and, you know, and then taking action to create, you know, the laws or the resolutions, you know, or, or in our case, you know, in Standing Rock, the titles <laughs> um, to, you know, to create those and get them, you know, in black and white on paper uh, so that they can be enforced. So, you know, it's it's a growth process and it's, you know, still happening and there's still a lot of work to be done. Wow, so you've worked in a lot of different communities. I have, yes. <laughs> um, actually, oh, actually, there were even more than that because I used to work at the University of Idaho. Okay, after I finished working for the Nespers Nation, I, were, I moved up to Moscow, Idaho, and worked at the University of Idaho as the director of the Northwest Nations Upward Bound Program. So I worked with five different tribal communities in the four state regions of Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. So yeah, I've worked with all of those tribal communities as well um, with the youth. So. All right, uh, so just to paraphrase, uh, Studying Rock does have a title in place to protect people with disabilities. Um, and you believe that uh, at the tribal at, at the tribal level, you know, there's always room for improvement. Awareness is definitely the first step. And then realizing there's a need and creating um, solutions to fill that need. Yeah, taking action. Exactly. Thanks for paraphrasing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty easy with your but the way you were saying it, so back at you. Um, all right. Well, since we have that one all squared away, let's go ahead and move into the next question. And again, you know, whoever wants to take this question can. Um, how does your tribe address support services for persons with disabilities and their families, such as home support programs, respite coverage for parents? personal care attendants, and other care, other caregivers? Uh, do you want me to answer? Sure. Okay, so I have some insight on into this just because, you know, when um, right after, so Mateo's injury um, occurred while we were living in Salt Lake City, Utah, and then like about three weeks after it occurred, we moved to um, the Nez Perce Nation in Lapway, Idaho. So I was living on the Nez Perce Nation when, you know, when he was just, you know, in the early stages of recovering from his traumatic brain injury. So he had years of speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy you know, as well as all of his follow-up, you know, medical appointments with the neurologists and the ophthalmologists and, you know, um, and then all the regular childhood stuff that happens. So um, when I, going through that experience, um, I, the, we did get, basically we had, I felt like the tribes don't have any, and I've seen this also in the other communities I've worked in since then, that they mainly just rely on um, what's already in place. So you know how every state has a Division of Developmental Disabilities, DDD. So Mateo was a DDD client in Idaho. 
And then when we moved down here, I tried to get him in with DDD and they said, oh, well, TBI is not one of our priority um, disability categories. So then he wasn't the DDD client anymore. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize how much it changed from, you know, state to state. Um, but, you know, we found out the hard way. And then um, with DDD in Idaho, we were receiving respite care um, because, it, you know, it was a, a service provided through DDD. It wasn't anything, you know, there wasn't anything available at the tribal level. And not that it would have been provided to me because I was not an Esper's tribal member, but um, you know, just living in the community and, you know, being aware of what was provided for, for people with disabilities, there was not a lot. And it's been the same way. Um, I definitely see that as a, as the current situation in Gila River, that a lot of our kids in Gila River aren't getting what they need because they have to go outside of the community, off the tribal lands to get the services that they need. And, you know, there's so many barriers to that um, actually happening. And I feel like parents just get overwhelmed. I mean, I know, you know, back in the, um, the battle for services, you know, the years that that was going on, it's, there's so much. And then especially, you know, if you're a single parent, like I was, if you have a full-time job, like I've always had, and you know, then also to take care of all of the paperwork and all of the appointments and everything, you know, related to providing, um, you know, making sure that your child with a disability gets what, what he needs. That's a lot. And, you know, there wasn't room for much else during those years. Um, and it was very, you know, what I, in doing my own research, what I learned is that you know, um, it was very crucial to get as much done as possible in the early years because that, um, you know, in in the the science of brain development, you know, that was the biggest window of opportunity was those early years. And so, you know, I just uh, made sure that I found every resource and every opportunity for growth and development and support, you know, for him during those early years. So, you know, he went to, when we moved up to the University of Idaho, he was um, in their developmental preschool program, um, you know, also continued to receive DDD services, was in early intervention up to age three, then transitioned, you know, he had an IFSP um, through early intervention, and then that transitioned into an IEP when he was three, and then, you know, which carried over into the school system when he started kindergarten down here in Arizona. So, um, you know, he had an IEP all 12 years. Um, but anyway, back to the question. <laughs> um, I feel like the parents totally rely on, and the tribes really, I feel like there's definitely room for improvement because the tribes think, oh, okay, that service is being provided by the state. But then what they don't realize, like especially in Gila River, is there are a lot of Children who are DDD clients who are not receiving services because the DDD providers don't want to come out to the um, tribal community because it's so far away from the urban area. So there's the, the cost of travel time because they can stay in the urban area and travel quickly from home to home and provide services, whereas they have to take up more of their time traveling out to the, to the rural area on the reservation to provide services. So I think there's like a, you know, it, it ends up being, you know, less money for them in, t in terms of services provided. So um, that's an issue. You know, I've actually had parents tell me that they know that their child is eligible for DDD, but they don't want to um, go through the whole, you know, complicated process of enrolling them um, because they're not going to get the services anyway because they live in the rural community. And I feel like that's, I've heard that from other tribal members, you know, from other tribes as well. So that's an issue. Um, so that definitely, I think that's an area where, you know, there should be like a task force, you know, each tribe should have their own like disability task force where they could identify, you know, for their own communities, you know, what, what are, what's needed to really support people with disabilities within the community, you know, to, 
so that they don't have to, you know, go off the community to um, get what they need to grow and develop to their full potential. And I will stop for now. <laughs> I'll just add to that that I think the tribes could do workforce development where they are paying for the training so their own people become the service providers, the speech therapists, the physical therapists, et cetera. I mean, that those two things kind of go hand in hand. Oh, I totally agree. That would be great. Um, wow, that was a lot of information, a lot of good information. That is that is crazy <laughs> that they don't provide services out there. Like how can't you, you would, I, I don't know. know. I feel like that's something you right. could get sued over. So I don't understand why you wouldn't want to like provide services. Yeah, and you know, that's another thing that I've, that, that puzzles me all the time because <laughs> I myself, um, through the course of trying to, you know, do the best of my ability to advocate for Mateo, have had to file a couple of OCR complaints um, about issues. You know, one when he was in a tribal Head Start program and one when he was um, at, a, you know, his senior year of high school. And, you know, I will take it to that level because, you know, his future is that important. But what puzzles me is a lot of times the parents that I work with, they're just very, um, they're not as, <laughs> I don't know, um, maybe not as much connected to their warrior spirit as I am. Um, and they, yeah, so they just kind of want to not make waves or they feel, they don't feel confident, you know, even though I explain to them their rights. You know, I'm every time there's an issue that comes up, I'm like, okay, you have options and you have rights and you could do this or this or this. And I explain all of the, you know, the dispute resolution options that are available to them under IDEA. Um, also, you know, the OCR process. Also, you know, sometimes there's other um, complaint avenues that they have um, with the State Department of Education. You know, I explain all that to them. and you know, maybe it overwhelms them or something, but most of them end up just doing nothing. You know, they feel like powerless when they really do have a lot of power, but it's just taking that step, you know, having enough courage or, you know, fortitude or strength or, or yeah. bravery maybe to. It's the, it's the same <laughs> to, thing I mentioned earlier, yeah. like people who don't enroll their children and uh, developmental disability services because it's so such a rigorous process and it's overwhelming right. and so they just kind of go along instead yes. of push back it's the same thing right it's intimidating right right but the other thing too that I had a parent tell to me or express to me about DDD is um, because she had triplets and all three of them you know had pretty severe delays and so they definitely would qualify for DDD, but she was like, no, because um, she had an older son who was in junior high who was a DDD client. And she's the one who said, well, he's been a DDD client for years and he hasn't received any services. So why do I want to do triple the paperwork <laughs> um, to getting these three enrolled when they're not going to get services any, you know, either? And also because the state uses our children, our native children, you know, as a number to say, okay, well, we have this many children, you know, native children en enrolled as DDD clients, but yet they're not. And so they're like getting funding, but they're not providing the services. And yes, you're right. You know, what you said is that should be a lawsuit <laughs> like it should be, but it's not going to happen unless the parents take some action. Wow. Um, yeah. Robin, do you have any other questions you wanted to ask? Well, there's a lot of work to be done. It's in, it's, <laughs> it's not just in tribal communities. It's uh, any community that has people with disabilities, which it means everywhere. Right. Right. Um, well, I think that's a good segue into the next question. Unless Mateo, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, so the next question: What are the major barriers for people with disabilities on your reservation? 
Well, <laughs> I, I would say uh, that would be transportation. Uh, a lot of tribal communities that I have seen just, you know, um, <laughs> not, you know, they don't have sidewalks. You know, they don't have, uh, <laughs> they have just dirt sides to the roads and, you know, just, you know, just regular roads in general that stretch, you know, you know, that just stretch from house to house to house and there's not much um, true um, uh, need for, well, <laughs> there is a need for transportation there. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, a lot of Native communities are rural. Um, they, you know, they don't, um, they're not around a lot of, um, or at least closely around a lot of big cities. And so, um, you know, just getting services and getting just place to place, you know, to even getting off the, you know, off, you know, the reservation, you know, the tribal land to get those services is just, you know, an arduous process, you know, in it, you know, of in itself. So, you know, for me, I think it is very much transportation because with anything, uh, transportation is, you know, key of, of, uh, you know, of, you know, independence of, you know, getting what you need, um, you know, so um, and that's one of the things that I would say. Um, the other thing is technology. There is, you know, a huge hindrance in that, you know, um, most, most tribes, most nation, you know, native nations, they are, you know, <laughs> the past generation, you know, they've had, you know, people have had, you know, a real switch of just surviving to, you know, a, you know, a state of sustainability, but yet technology has not, um, you know, has not, I would say, you know, it's still a big, big uh, detriment, especially internet. Uh, a lot of the the internet service providers, the ISPs, they won't uh, they won't go to uh, uh, rural or tribal uh, you know, tribal lands because there's no money in it, you know, to them, and you know they've all agreed that yeah. You know, you know, they they do uh, they usually agree and divvy up. You know where they where they are. You know, providing services so they're not. You know, um, so they're not disrupting each other's businesses. And uh, you know, it's agreed that you know tribal communities are not a big money maker for them. So they're not going out into the. You know, so internet it's not going out into into them. Uh, into the tribe, uh, into uh, Native nations. They've had to rely on their own internet uh, service providers to make their own. So I think, you know, definitely it's technology and te uh, transportation that is a big factor and big barriers in, <laughs> you know, in uh, modern times and you know, in this, at this time. And what I'd like to add about those two areas is, you know, like Matteo said, technology, it's kind of like the pathway to independence for people with disabilities, because, you know, thinking of prior to the pandemic, <laughs> um, you know, you need to be able to transport yourself for education, you know, um, even post-secondary, you know, college or vocational um, you need to transport yourself to jobs. Um, and, you know, all, both of those areas should be included for every person with a disability. But if you can't even access the pathway <laughs> to, 
to get to your education or your employment, you know, that's a problem. And then also, as the pandemic showed us, especially what I've really seen is the technology barrier. Um, like Mateo said, there's a, the barrier of, you know, actually the quality of technology or even, you know, having technology at all. But, you know, there are still, you know, many homes without, you know, the internet. And um, even just people's knowledge about um, technology once they do get it, because, you know, when the pandemic hit, so many of our parents, they'd never had to deal with technology before. They didn't know how to, you know, set things up, um, you know, get on online, do anything, you know, and those were all extra barriers. Um, and so what we've seen now that we're like, you know, year and a half, close to two years into the pandemic, is with the students with disabilities. Myself and my coworker, you know, we get calls every day from parents, you know, their children, you know, have been doing paper packets, you know, they're so far behind in school, they're not meeting their IEP goals, you know, it's just getting worse, really. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, that we can get the pandemic under control soon and that things will start improving. Um, but anyway, yeah, technology is definitely continues to be a barrier. I'm sorry, I'm writing in a couple of notes. Um, so okay. transportation and technology are definitely barriers to uh, people with disabilities across most reservations that are rural and aren't near yeah. major cities. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh, one thing, one thing that I thought was really um, unique about both um, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, as well as the Gila River Indian community, um, which are both, you know, here close to the Phoenix metro area, um, is that they both have their own um, internal tribally funded operated uh, transportation system. So it's cute because, you know, Salt River had their own, <laughs> we lived, we lived in Salt River up until about four months ago. We, we lived in Salt River the whole time since we moved down here and they had their own little transportation um, bus system. So Mateo would take it because he started um, at Salt Lake, or sorry, um, at Scottsdale Community College. And so we, we lived about a mile or, or two miles away from that college. And so he would take the Salt River transportation bus over there. So we would come by the house and pick him up and he'd pay 25, 25 cents because, you know, he was a student with a disability. So we had to submit his disability documentation and he got a lower rate to ride the bus. So we only had to pay like 25 cents to get to school every day <laughs> to college classes. And then it would bring him home. So he utilized that for a while. And then even in Gila River, they have their own um, internal, you know, within the tribal lands, um, bus routes, little, you know, mini buses that transport, you know, the tribal members from, you know, their homes to the healthcare clinics, to the community service centers, to, you know, the tribal offices and buildings, you know, where, wherever they need to go within the, the tribal community. So I thought that was pretty innovative um, and helpful, definitely needed. Well, that's pretty cool that they have their own uh, transportation system. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. What are the barriers to healthcare experienced by people with disabilities in your tribal community? I mean, I, I would say that um, that those barriers are just coming down from um, coming down to really just 
bureaucracy. <laughs> I mean, IHS, uh, Indian Health Services, is not the best uh, bout to take. Um, <laughs> just because, you know, you have to navigate uh, and, like, just do a lot of paperwork just to do one step of one process. You know, it's it's ridiculous. And so, you know, you, you know I've, I've seen people just not go to the hospital because they don't want to deal with, you know, that level of bureaucracy that, you know, is, in my opinion, not needed. I mean, I know why it's there, but it's just not, I don't think it really is needed. So I, I would say bureaucracy is at the heart of that matter for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I kind of agree. I do agree with that because, you know, we've had plenty of personal experiences that we're not pleasant with, you know, IHS services. Um, and there's definitely room for improvement within that system. But also what I've seen is, um, you know, when, when I had to make the decision to um, select providers, you know, medical providers for my son, you know, when he was younger, it was mainly about, you know, can I trust this person? You know, are they, what I saw and had to deal a lot with is, you know, there was some discrimination. There was judgments, you know, because we were, you know, um, people with brown skin and, you know, just what had happened to him, there was a lot of judgment. And I felt like times that got in the way of his care, the quality of his care. And then also, um, uh, I would say, you know, lack of cultural um, awareness or cultural respect. Um, I remember he had to have a brain surgery. Um, and uh, before the surgery, you know, they were saying, you know, that he may have to have the full, um, well, what is it called, where they actually take off um, part of his skull that they might have, he might, they might need to do that, but they wouldn't need, they wouldn't be able to determine if they had to do that until they actually got into the surgery, you know, room um, and, you know, and saw what, you know, the extent of the damage. But um, I said, okay, well, if you need to do that, you know, cause he had long hair um, it, and it was, you know, long since birth. And I said, if you need to do that, I, you know, I want his hair. And I specifically told them that, and they, they did end up cutting his hair and they didn't, you know, they just disregarded my, re my request. They didn't give me his hair. So there's cultural, you know, consideration, lack of cultural respect. I definitely felt disrespected in that. And so was he. Um, and I would say also, you know, just tr no, trying to figure out who you can trust, you know, who, you know, with the care of your child. Um, to provide them with the best services possible. Um, I would say also lack of customer service on in, um, sometimes. Um, just being aware of differences in, in cultural or in communication. You know, how people from tribal communities, they're, how their communication styles are different. And being aware of that and then actually being able to adapt, you know, having medical providers adapt their own, you know, communication styles so that people from tribal communities feel heard. You know, what I've seen so much of, because you know how, like with medical billing, it's all about the money and, you know, you want to try to hurry and get your, your patient in and out so you can get to the next one, so you can bill them, so you can make more money. And I feel like a lot of times that inter, um, interrupts true communication, you know, especially with elders. You know, there is definitely a way, you know, a space that you need to create to effectively communicate with elders. Um, you know, and there's such a, what I've seen is, and usually by non-native providers, um, is, you know, there's, they talk so fast, they don't wait for a response. 
they try to, they interrupt, they try to second guess what you're saying. Um, you know, they try to finish your sentences for you. <laughs> and it's just, the whole thing is just totally disrespectful. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, like Mateo said, sometimes people just don't feel up to putting up with that. So they don't seek out care. So that's another area where, you know, there could be some improvements made. So what I'm hearing from you guys, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, just bureaucracy, just the amount of paperwork need to, people need to go through, um, cultural disrespect, miscommunication. Um, is, was there anything that I missed? Um, lack of awareness of cultural communication styles and differences okay. and honoring them. I have a quick question. Um, yes. When you were, you gave some great examples. And when, so when you were talking about when Mateo had his brain surgery and they didn't give you his hair back. And then later when you were talking about um, non-native providers talking too fast, interrupting, second guessing what you were going to say, is that, is that like all healthcare systems or was that particularly with IHS, who, who um, was, was it across the, the hair incident? The hair incident happened at a, you know, a a non IHS hospital in Lewiston, Idaho, um, with non native providers, um, and you know, you know, usually the providers at IHS hospitals, IHS hospitals are also non native, um, but. Um, oh, yeah. Mateo's trying to get his, his charger because there's a message on the phone saying that his battery is going to run out. Oh, no. So he's, he's hooking that up. <laughs> but, um, oh, what was the other one you, you mentioned? Okay. The, the, there's the hair well, one. I was just was saying one? in general, you were just talking about the whole healthcare system in general. I wasn't specific yes. to IHS. I, I just wanted a clarification. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So it's not always IHS. But, you know, I mean, an example of that was specifically happened at IHS, it didn't happen with Mateo, but it did happen with my older son, is um, he was in a police explorer program, you know, where they, you know, train youth, you know, who might want to have um, positions in law enforcement in the future. And so, you know, as you young people and they do a lot of community service. So anyway, he was with his police explorer group and they were at like an amusement park. And my son <laughs> jumped over a fence because he was trying to catch up to a girl. And he ended up, um, it was a fence with spikes on the top. So his leg got caught as he was jumping over and he ended up, you know, it, a spike ended up entering his leg behind his knee. So they had to like get him off the fence. They took him to the local IHS hospital here in Phoenix. And the surgeon was so, uh, oh, it makes me mad to this day to talk about it, but he was so rude and so disrespectful. And he totally said to my son, this is what he said to my son. He goes, oh, so you were jumping over a fence. Were you carrying a TV as you jumped over this fence? Oh my God. Like implying that he was, you know, like in the middle of committing a robbery, you know, while he was injured just automatically made that ass that assumption because my older son also has, has long hair, you know, and, you know, and of course, brown skin. So, you know, he just walked in the room and that was like the first thing he said to him. And then later on, when I filed the complaint about that, he's, he um, said, Oh, well, I was just joking, but you know, that's not a joke. So anyway, that was definitely an IHS um, that happened at an IHS facility. Wow. There is a need for training and cultural respect. Um, all right, let me go back to the questions really quick. Were you guys able to find a charger for the phone? Yeah, he has it charging right now. Okay. Um, 
All right. Okay, and then the next question is, are children with disabilities treated differently in your school systems? <laughs> I'm sure you guys have a lot to say with this. <laughs> I could already hear it yes. with that little chuckle <laughs> there. This is a definite yes for both of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which can is I, so sad. Can I add to that question, yeah. if you don't mind, just a little bit? Because, yeah. because the purpose of the interviews is um, we're interested in finding quotes that will introduce chapters. So if you have a positive story related to um, children with disabilities in the school system, to, as well as the, you know, the children <laughs> being treated differently, I, I would be interested in hearing both because um, we do want some success stories, even though right. it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of discrimination against people with disabilities and particularly uh, Native Americans. Right. Yeah, and thank you for pointing that out because um, I think it's so important to, you know, focus on the positive because yeah, you're right. We always do focus on the negative. Um, but we also, we, meaning me and Mateo, also try to learn as much as possible from those negative experiences and, you know, so that, so that we end up benefiting from them since we had to go through them, you know, might as well, um, find the bright side, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> to them. So, um, but yeah, we will definitely think of some positive examples to share. Um, did you want to go first? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> okay. Oh, let's see. Okay. So, so let's see. I could talk about your school system. Um, yeah. Okay. So, one example that I have seen, you know, with the families and the children, the, you know, Native families and children that I've worked with and currently work with in Gila River, and also with us personally in our own family is the low expectations of the special education system. It feels like once a child is identified as a student needing special education services, that they are kind of not, ex that not a whole lot is expected from them. But I saw that, you know, up close and personal and firsthand. So then when Mateo, you know, was a special education student, I made sure that, you know, he had a different experience um, and held him to high expectations, you know, here at home and in school. And that's why he was able to graduate with <laughs> 10 years of perfect attendance, um, which was actually a goal that he made for himself when he was in elementary school. And they gave him um, an award, an alarm clock, a SpongeBob, SpongeBob alarm clock. And he came home and he was like so um, proud of it. Um, because he had earned perfect attendance. And so he's like, well, I'm going to try to, you know, get perfect attendance, you know, next semester too. And then that just kept going each semester and it eventually turned into 10 years of perfect attendance. And so, um, you know, that, I feel like, you know, that was a good way. Well, just that helping parents realize that they can counteract the effect of, you know, low expectations for special education students. Um, and I think a lot of times people do that because, you know, they don't want to like, you know, I guess, I think from the educator side, they don't want to stress out the special ed student or, you know, they're doing it with like, their heart's in the right place, but they're really doing a disservice to the student when they don't, um, you know, help them reach their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. And that was always our focus. You know, I would tell Mateo that, you know, you go to school every day and that school system is not set up for you. You know, first of all, it's not, you know, it was not designed for Native students. And there's a reason why the graduation rate is 50% for Native students. So, you know, armed with that knowledge, you need to make sure that you are doing your best every day. You're not competing. You're not there to compete with everybody else because that school system is set up about competition. You know, your GPA and you know, how their class rank and all of that. I said, but you do not buy into that because that's not who we are as Native people. You know, we're not trying to be better than other people or compete with other people. 
you know, we're trying to improve ourselves, you know, to the best of our ability every day. So that was like the reminder, um, you know, every fall when both of my sons started school and, you know, they were, you know, they, there was structure and routine and all of that that's necessary to, you know, pr- produce good results at school. So, um, Mateo, um, at about seventh grade, he was, oh, he, he transitioned into seventh grade and he was receiving um, pull-out services for English. Wait, no, um, special education, like classroom services for, for reading and math. And so um, he, no, wait, writing, English, English and math, that was it. And so he was in the special ed teacher, um, her classroom for English. And then he came home like a couple weeks into his seventh grade school year. And he said, mom, I don't like my special ed teacher, the English teacher, um, because she just gives us packets and we have to work on them by ourselves the whole period. And he told me, this was his exact words. He said, I feel like someone put me in a crib and just, you know, walked away and never came back to check on me. And I was like that. And that kind of horrified me because I'm like, that is not the kind of educational experience that I want my child to be having. And so that started this like (laughs) um, semester long um, battle. It was literally a battle. We had so many IEP meetings and things, you know, went south and they got so out of control and we got yelled at <laughs> by the principal. And um, anyway, so we endured all that. And the school did not want him to, um, to they, they were fighting him because he said he wanted to be in the regular, you know, regular English classroom, regular, the general education classroom with all his other students. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's your right. So let's, let's do that. Or, you know, let's see if you can do it. And um, the school fought us on that. For whatever reason, they didn't want to give him that opportunity. Um, but eventually we, we prevailed. And by the second semester, he was ro- enrolled in the regular, the general education math class and the general education English class. <laughs> and um, so, oh, and then when he got into those classes, I also had the conversation with him. I said, you know, because you've been take you've been in the special education math and English classroom, you know, through elementary school, you're probably behind your um, peers who have, you know, been in the general education classroom all along. I said, so you're going to have to work extra hard. You know, you're going to have some catching up to do. So he would come home every day after school and we get, you know, to work on his homework, he would start, he would work for hours every day on his homework through seventh grade, that second semester, seventh grade. And he went to like a Saturday academy at the school, the junior high, um, for several hours in the morning um, to prepare for, um, back then it was the state test called AIMS. Now it's some, now it's AZ Merit, but um, prepare for that. And, but he made significant academic progress. And he was um, starting his second semester of seventh grade. Um, He was on the honor roll every semester from then until he graduated. And when he graduated, he was on the principal's honor roll, which is, you know, the high honor roll. And so um, that's, you know, to me, that's, that's really his accomplishment. You know, I facilitated, I set up meetings, et cetera. I filled out paperwork, you know, but he put in all of the effort to create that change within himself. And so the positive message about the school system is that, you know, parents are very influential and they can empower their children, you know, at any point in their, in their school career. Um, You know, it's just having those heart to heart talks with your child, um, you know, being in tune with them you know, having that connection so that, you know, and taking action and following through, um, you know, being a united front, (laughs) you know, to, to get what the school system is giving all of the other kids, you know, even if you have to fight extra hard for it. Um, That's so, so but I just have to say as an educator, how powerful that was. That was incredible. And just listening to 
But when you were saying they wouldn't let him in general ed English, I was like, he's so articulate. Like, that's where he belongs. That's crazy that they fought you. Well, okay. So what happened is that. Congratulations to you, Mateo. I mean, on a roll, all, every semester from seventh grade on, that's, that's uh, you know, that's a very small percentage of a school population. So kudos to right. you working so hard. <laughs> so that seventh, seventh grade um, English teacher, um, when I first brought up the issue to her um, in an IEP meeting, she just stood up and said, I said, well, this is what my son said to me. And, you know, he said that you give him packets. And she just stood up from the table and said, I'm done. I'm not participating in this meeting and tried to storm out. <laughs> but the funny thing was that meeting was happening in her room. So she really didn't storm out. <laughs> and so I said, after the meeting, I said, well, you know, I don't want him in her classroom anymore. So they ended up putting him in a seventh grade or sorry, an eighth grade English class that they, and the eighth grade teacher, it was a special ed English class. And she um, refused to allow him to participate in her class. So he was basically just sitting in her class while we were trying to resolve is these issues. Um, but he was, he was actually participating because he was listening to the information that she was presenting and he was, you know, reading along in the book that they were reading and, you know, um, so, but it was just, it was amazing to me how negative that experience was. It was like, kind of like a nightmare. Cause I thought, wow, this is horrible, you know, and it got worse before it got better. And, um, but anyway, but yeah, he prevailed is the whole point. And so then when he got into high school, um, there were several positive things that happened. And um, one of them was um, he is, he, oh, the school had this um, math, online math program called Alex. It's A-L-E-K-S. And it, it is based on, um, it's mastery based. So like you have to, you know how math is very much, it builds on, you know, one, from one year to the next. And so if you're missing any like concepts in math, you know, it takes you back and makes sure that you have, um, that you have a solid foundation in one, you know, one step of math before you get to move on to the next level. So he was able, he was in that, um, let's see, he took like, algebra freshman year and went into geometry um, um, sophomore year. And then halfway through geometry, they put him into the Alex program with a math teacher who has her doctorate degree and also had a daughter with a disability. So I think that all helped. And he was, he stayed in that Alex class through his senior year and worked his way up to calculus on Alex. And so then the, that helped him a lot because then when he went into um, the community college system, um, you know how you have to take your placement exams. So they place you into, you know, whichever level of reading and math and English. So he was able to test into college level math and only had to take one math class in college. And I used to um, be an academic advisor at um, Salt Lake community college. And I saw the struggle for students with disabilities with math and how they would take math every semester and, you know, they would get tutoring, you know, I would set them up with tutoring. Um, and it, you know, it was such a struggle and there was so much anxiety and, you know, I was so grateful that he had been, you know, academically prepared very well in, and so that he was able to transition more smoothly, you know, into college and only have to take the one college level math class to meet his requirement. So it was awesome. That's one success story. Um, another one is with, um, he took chemistry in high school. I mean, yeah, in high school. And um, the chemistry teacher came to me and said, um, I'm worried about Mateo. I don't know if he'll be able to do, um, there's a section in chemistry called stoichiometry. And he said it involves, you know, some higher level math. I'm not sure if he'll be able to do it. And I said, well, I'm not sure if he'll be able to do it either, but, you know, let's give it a try. And so um, he did. <laughs> Mateo on the unit, the stoichiometry unit, um, he got like a 98% on his stoichiometry unit test. And so 
Um, but what I appreciated was, you know, the communication from the teacher, you know, giving me a heads up saying, you know, so that I'm prepared, you know, if it went the other direction and he wasn't able to, you know, or needed extra support to learn stoichiometry, then we could have done that. So, you know, forming those collaborative um, relationships with the school, with the teachers and with the school, you know, can be such a, you know, can make such a difference academically. Um, another disability related um, win for Mateo was that he developed an interest in drama. And so in his junior year, he decided to audition for a play in high school. And his, uh, the play <laughs> happened to be One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So I get a call from the drama teacher and she's like, <laughs> Mateo auditioned today and he did great. And I want him to be in this play. And I want to cast him as, of course, <laughs> um, Chief Bromden. And I'm like, okay, that's great. She goes, but I'm worried because Chief Bromden, because, you know, he's that's um, a lead role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And so he goes, she said, I'm worried because he, um, Chief Bromden has several monologues, you know, which are like paragraph long you know, um, statements that he has to say on stage. And she goes, I don't know if, um, you know, if he'll be able to, if, you know, how his memory will be, you know, will he be able to memorize that much? And I said, well, I said, I don't know. She goes, but she, she said, but I have a backup plan. And she goes, I wanted to run this by you. She goes, if he's not able to do it, what we could do is have him do a recording of it. And then during the performances, we could just play the recording, you know, while he's there on stage. So it's still his voice and it's still him, you know, saying the monologues, but he didn't, he wouldn't have to memorize them. And I'm like, okay, that's a good plan B, but you know, let's see how he does. Or maybe he can learn one or two of the monologues because there was probably about seven or eight of them. And, um, you know, maybe he can memorize one or two or three or, you know, however many, and then we could use the backup plan for the ones that maybe if he's not able to memorize, we could use the backup plan for them. So we went forward with that plan and it turned out <laughs> that he was able to memorize all of them. So he didn't even have to, you know, use the plan B. Um, so that's just another example of, you know, collaborating with the teachers, try, looking, you know, for solutions, you know, to work um, around any, you know, the disability. So um, those were success stories. So we try to focus on those. But back to your question about the children, children in general, what I've noticed is yes, um, bullying remember, is still. Hang, oh, hang on, Tana. Uh, before okay. you go to bullying, I just want to say that those examples are also examples of low expectations that you were able to, I mean, the people were, you met them like beyond where they were and just kind of took it at surface value so that and said, okay, we'll have a plan B. Okay, I hear your concerns. Okay, let's give it a shot. Like you always believed in your son and he rose to the occasion. And yet it, initially it started because I think people are fearful and then, yes. and that's why there's low expectations. But anyway, I just yeah, I to say it's a positive, but also it reinforces your very first statement. <laughs> you're right. I didn't even look at it like that, but yeah. Um, but I think you're definitely right about the, the fear factor because people are so unknowledgeable about disabilities that it does make them fearful. They, they're they like afraid of messing up or, you know, afraid of dealing with it or bring, you know, talking about it or offending or whatever, you know, whatever the reason is. But yeah, fear is definitely a factor. Oh, so anyway, back to bullying. Bullying is an ongoing issue, you know, with our students with disabilities. And even though like here in Arizona, there's an, a law that supposedly prevents bullying you know, and on school websites, you'll see that they all have their district policy about addressing bullying, but it still happens. And so that is a major issue. You know, even just today, I was talking with um, a um, tribal social services case manager 
who has a high school student who needs an IEP, but he does not want one because of the bullying factor. You know, the stigma, the negative, negative stigma associated with, um, you know, with having an IEP and being a special education student. So that's a big ongoing area because that can be so damaging and so detrimental, you know, to our, our students who have disabilities, you know, and need extra supports and services to be academically successful. Um, and I'm not, not exactly sure, you know, what needs, what can be done about that, but, but it is an ongoing issue. Um, yeah, I definitely see bullying as an, as an issue that, um, children with disabilities would go through in school systems. And another interview that we were doing with, um, another, uh, advocate, she mentioned that possibly just, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's like diversity, equity, inclusion, D DEI programs starting at like early ages and just like teaching kids like hey everyone's different but we should all deserve the same amount of respect so i think maybe that's... oh thank you yeah thanks for letting me know about that i'm writing it down <laughs> oh, okay you know yeah. in, new, in new mexico they passed a law that requires every school to have a diversity equity and inclusion council so that those nice I, you know, I honestly, the way it plays out in action is that they put together the council and they have their meetings because it's required, but it's not taken in some schools, not all. It's not taken seriously. It's like one more thing we have right. to and check a box off. Unfortunately, right. it's such a great opportunity to do meaningful work. Right. Eventually, the right people will you know, come to the school that can support that. I can see where, you know, you know how hard change is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, educators are like, you know, um, expected to do so much. But it's good to know that this exists. I'm going to look more into it. Yeah, well, um, it's just an idea. I don't think there's any really research around it, but it is like a good idea because she mentioned just, um, yeah, talking about differences starting kids at like um, in preschool and just letting them know that, you know, not everyone has the same capabilities, but again, they should all be treated with the same kindness and respect as anyone else. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Yes, children with disabilities are treated differently in your school systems, um, but even though they are treated differently, there are um, a couple of positive experiences um, that do come from that. Did I miss anything? The bullying. Ah, uh, yes, the bullying. How could we forget that? <laughs> the ongoing. Problem with bullying, yeah. Well, I feel like the takeaway is just that, because you don't really realize this. I myself didn't realize this until, you know, years late. Now it's years later, and Mateo's about ready to graduate from college. Um, you know, so I've had a little bit of time to, you know, look back and kind of see things from a different perspective. And I feel like if parents can, you know, if if they can be informed that you know, how important um, the, how important it is to form collaborative working relationships with the school staff, you know, and how much that benefits their, um, their student, you know, going both ways, you know, how, so that the educators feel comfortable approaching the parents, because, you know, teachers have had to deal with you know, parent bullies is so, that, you know, themselves, mm -hmm. they're not always treated respectfully by parents. And so, you know, I feel like that kind of makes them maybe a little hesitant too to approach parents. So if parents can realize that, you know, the time that they invest in developing and creating and maintaining those collaborative working relationships with their child's teachers, the better off, you know, um, the better, the better off their child will be 
but it'll also be better to navigate problems when they come up and to get through them successfully. I think it, the with onus, no I think the onus huh? of building partnerships starts with the school because they have to come in with the attitude, we're partners in this child's education yes. and you're their first yes. teacher and you know them best and I defer to you. And then you start building. Yes. yes. That would be magical if that happened. <laughs> hey, that number eight, is it right? Of the questions? I don't know. I don't have them numbered. Um, I have, I do. Okay. You, you know which one's next, right? Yeah. All right. So we'll go ahead and move to the next question. What services supported employment, transportation assistance, job coach for employment for people with disabilities come from inside your tribe? Well, I think that that, you know, that varies from, from tribal community to tribal community. Um, what I noticed when we lived in Salt River, was um, because Mateo was, the, Salt River has a tribal voc, voc rehab program. So he was a um, tribal voc rehab client, even though he was, he was a member of another tribe living on, you know, living in Salt River. So he wasn't enrolled there. He was enrolled with his tribe, but still he was a tribal, uh, you know, a federally recognized tribal member. So, um, so I feel like that was very beneficial. And so if, you know, so if more tribes could apply for voc rehab programs, that would be great. Um, because that, to me, like the, I've always felt that we're, well, working with all the different tribal communities that I've seen, I feel like the, um, the solutions come from within the community themselves. So no, it's, we don't need more people trying to come in from the outside and saying, oh, well, this is what you should do to solve this problem in your community. To me, that's kind of offensive and rude and overstepping and a lot of other things. I feel like, you know, respecting the people from that community and helping them see that, you know, they have the solutions. You know, just like with us personally, you know, whatever's bothering us the, the as a person, as an individual, um, the solution, it comes from within. It doesn't come from outside sources. And so it's up to us as individuals to figure out, you know, what can I do to change my circumstances, situation, you know, to make things better for myself. So it's kind of an extension of that within the tribal communities that they, if they can realize or, you know, be guided or facilitated to, um, to finding those solutions that's what's going to provide lasting change and improvement. So, um, you know, cause some, some tribal communities provide these things and some don't. Um, <coughs> for example, in, oh, for example, in the Gila River, um, there's a department called employment and training so they have a whole staff of people that provide um, employment, job coaching, you know, all the basic, you know, work workforce development skills um, for tribal members to become employed. They have like a summer youth employment program. Um, but what we found is that it's not very um, diverse or sorry, disability friendly in terms of serving youth with disabilities. So, um, you know, that's maybe an area that can be improved upon. So, but that's just, you know, a, an example that's unique to one tribal community. So each tribe needs to do that, you know, self-reflection and self-analysis of their own, you know, programs and services, you know, existing programs and services to determine how accessible um, and inclusive they are to people with disabilities. Is Mateo there? Yes. Yeah. Mateo, can you speak to the kind of services you received from the VR program at Salt River? 
Um, I don't necessarily remember. So, <laughs> so they create. Um, she he worked with the Vogue Rehab Counselor to create his individual plan for employment. What I thought was what I really liked about it is how the Tribal Vogue Rehab Program had the, you know, um, autonomy, I guess, and um, ability to tailor his I, IPE, Individual Plan for Employment, to include cultural, cultural considerations. So he had, um, you know, a line item, you know, in his budgeted amount that if he wanted to participate in a cultural event or, you know, that costed money or that had a cost associated with it, that he, you know, that was already written into his plan. So I thought that was unique and definitely beneficial, you know, an advantage of having a, a you know, um, a tribal folk rehab pro program that was had a cultural focus and realized and affirmed, you know, the importance of cultural, you know, ceremonies, teachings, values, et cetera. So that was a unique feature of that. The rest of it was basically just your regular um, individual plan for employment about, you know, what classes to take, what services, you know, what was needed, you know. And so um, he didn't continue on as an adult with um, um, with Voc Rehab, but um, that was his experience when he had it in high school. Oh. But another benefit that we have that's related to voc rehab um, here in Arizona is the pre-employment training, or sorry, pre-employment transition services for any youth that's age 14 to 22 to get free training <laughs> in um, all of the areas that, that are covered in transition, you know, the transition services. So, you know, work readiness skills, um, um, what are the other areas like, oh, sorry, I should have this memorized, but, um, you know, work, work experience, mm -hmm. um, self-advocacy, um, ex like career exploration, you know, for what they're going to do after high school, um, college or vocational. So all of those needed areas that, you know, a high school student with a disability, with a disability, you know, needs to be, you know, that needs to be part of their transition plan. So it's called the PREETS, Pre-Employment Tra Transition Services Program that's offered through Voc Rehab in Arizona. So, and he did participate in that. Nice, thank you. Um, I have another question just trying to roll off the yes. conversation. Um, for certain VR services, would the state pick up some services if the tribe didn't offer them? Was there like collaboration between? Um, well, what I found out recently, because um, I didn't know this before, like about a couple months ago, is that um, if you're a tribal member, <laughs> you could actually be dual enrolled in a state voc rehab program and a um, tribal voc rehab program. And I'm like, okay, more, more of our tribal members need to know about this. So, um, because you know, it's written differently. So if there is something that you know, the tribal member needs that the state voc rehab program is not able to provide, then you know, hopefully it can be written into um, their tribal voc rehab plan. Is that nationally so I've been or just in Arizona? Arizona? Oh, sorry. I'm not sure. I was just told, I, I found out about it in a training from Voc Rehab um, here in Arizona. It might be by state, Desiree, depending on their uh, statewide VR plan. I would bet most a lot of dual enrollment though. All right. So as far as services go that come from inside the tribe, it definitely varies from tribe to tribe. Yes. Okay. All right. A um, couple more questions to go to. Uh, so the next question, unless you guys have anything else to add to this. 
previous one. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, so what changes would you like to see made within your tribe or others that would result in improved services and programs to assist people with disabilities who live in Indian country? Okay. Um. Um, sure. So, uh, what I would like to see is um, really just um, I just forgot what I was going to say. So. <laughs> okay. Well, while he's gathering his thoughts, because I know he had something important to say, <laughs> but um. I think that um, improved services and programs. Okay. I think that at the tribal level, I kind of think I kind of already like um, mentioned it that each tribe needs to do their own self assessment. Like I had said earlier, even was like maybe a task force <laughs> or something, you know, at the tribal level to you know analyze do that internal analysis of how are we doing in serving our tribal members with disabilities so if that could take place and then i feel like the process would kind of guide itself at after that point in time because then I, areas could be identified um it would almost be like maybe even if you if um tribes followed like a strategic planning process you know, that with the specific steps that are included in strategic planning, you know, to assess, you know, what are the community needs, you know, what, you know, our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what can we do about it, you know, even if they already followed like that existing framework, but applied it to um, available services for people with disabilities and what's needed, I feel like a lot of really valuable and relevant information could come out of that. And then they could you know, set their funding priorities and move forward from there. And also, I feel like it would also be a better, a better um, utilization or collaboration with the existing services that are already provided by state um, and federal um, agencies. So, you know, like DDD, you know, like um, IDEA, you know, with the school system. So, you know, because those are important, but I feel like right now most of the tribes are like only a lot, only relying on those and not really looking at what else could be done to, you know, enhance or even just provide basic services that are lacking for tribal members with disabilities. Yeah, yeah I think a needs assess a needs assessment was followed by st strategic planning, and then I really liked what you said about complementing and enhancing state programs as well as providing what's lacking. I mean, you're talking about closing all the gaps, which right exactly you've reinvented the perfect world again. <laughs> right. <laughs> it sounds so easy when we're talking about it. <laughs> um, Mateo, was there anything else you, you wanted to add or is, would you like to pass on this question? Pass. Okay. I'd like to pass. All right. Phone <laughs> a friend, maybe? Just kidding. Um. <laughs> Your life, <laughs> life. All right, uh, so the next question is, uh, what suggestions or recommendations do you have that would improve communication and collaboration among federal, state, tribal governments on issues that would improve support and services to people with disabilities in Indian country? I feel like we've already kind of 
brushed up against this um, question in previous. Right, right. One thing I want to say about this one in particular, is like, there's things that happen that people don't know about, such as um, one example of this was we had a, in Gila River, we had a, a tribal member who, whose daughter um, had finished eighth grade, and then the parent was trying to decide which high school to send her to, and she was very apprehensive because, you know, the, the student is nonverbal, um, you know, and had, you know, a pretty severe develop, um, disability. So, and plus the student had tried to run away from school previously. So myself and my coworker, we were working with this parent to try to figure out which school might have the right program, which one would be a good fit, you know, so we checked out... Um, a couple of schools and even calling the local, you know, Phoenix Union High School District, um, school district to try to figure out which school this parent, you know, which boundary school was her high school. Um, the, it, the parent ended up living in an unincorporated area of the reservation land, tribal land. And so she didn't really fall into one of those, you know, boundary schools. It literally took us, we got the runaround, myself and my coworker, and we called Arizona Department of Ed, and we called, they told us to call um, the Maricopa County Superintendent's Office, who ended up referring us back to the Phoenix Union High School District Office. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So myself and my coworker and the parent, all three of us were trying to work on this for like four months before we could find out where this student should go to school at. And part of the problem was once we found a school, they promised, because this was during the pandemic, and they were like, you know, and parent was apprehensive already. So they said, well, let's, um, you could do a, this parent wanted to do like a tour of the school. So she would understand like the layout of the school, where the classrooms were in relation to the bus stop, et cetera. So, um, the school said, okay, yeah, we can do that. And first they promised her an in-person tour. Then they changed it to a virtual tour. Then they stopped taking her phone calls and just ignored her till she went away. And so anyway, the student ended up getting enrolled at a different school and is now attending there. But it was so unbelievable to me that with three adults, working on this, it still took us like four months to get this student into school. So she, of course, ended up starting late. And so now she's already behind, you know, but we were all trying our best. But it was just, I was like, how is this happening in 2020? You know, because this was just last year. And so odd things like that happen. So a clarifying um, question, they... They drew the bound the attendance the boundaries of their attendance area for their particular schools, and where yes. this young lady resided, that land was not within the attendance area of any of the high schools. Right. And right. so then, right. when once the school figured that out, then they could take in the parents' calls. Um. Yes crazy i know horrible yeah is she even though she's playing catch up is she doing okay now the student um well <laughs> i would like to say yes but no um there's been some problems now the classroom teacher the most recent incident the classroom teacher is um engaging in, in unprofessional conduct toward the parent and, you know, the parent herself has some um, health related issues and a disability herself. And basically the teacher is bullying the parent at this point. She has the, the teacher who is male has yelled at the parent, um, told her that this is not um, to stop sending her student to school early because this is not a kindergarten when the parent didn't realize the student was arriving to school early because transportation is set up by the school, um, told the 
um, recently, just last week, screamed at the parent because the parent was requested a meeting. Parent showed up at the school, um, was waiting at the spot where the teacher told her to, but the teacher got angry at the parent because she didn't walk over to the registration office. The parent uses a cane and saw the registration office, but felt like it was too far for her to navigate with her cane. And the teacher ended up yelling at the parent um, and told her that he was just going to have to, you know, consider her the customer and the customer's always right. (laughs) So, so anyway, now it's at the district level and the parent has contacted the district special ed director and, you know, they're going to have a meeting, but you know, things aren't going well. So, and I'm thinking if the, if the classroom teacher can talk to the parent that so rudely and disrespectfully, how is he treating her student in the classroom? Right. That's my concern. So, so things are not going well. Yeah. And she, the, and the student is nonverbal, so she can't tell the parent right. what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. They yep. don't have cameras in classroom. They only have them in the hallway. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Well, it sounds like you have I know. to do with this family and the school. Right. Yep. So you were going to say uh, recommendations to improve communication between federal, state, and tribal governments. Yes. So I used, or I explained that complex situation to point out that, you know, um, I feel like there's always kind of communication barriers. You know, even if you're trying to communicate effectively, you know, it still doesn't always happen. And I feel like each one of these agencies that we got, you know, redirected to, um, because we came full circle, we started out with the school district who referred us to ADE, who referred us to the state superintendent, who referred us back to the school district, that, you know, they were all working with good intent and trying to be helpful, but they didn't realize that this unique situation existed. So there definitely needs to be improved communication um, among the different entities that work with tribal um, communities. So um, I don't know what the exact solution is. Um, I know that I'm, I actually, I feel like people being more involved on, you know, um, agency boards and state organizations is helpful, you know, so they can get the native perspective on, you know, actual problem areas that are being encountered by people with disabilities. Um, So that's why um, myself and my son are trying to engage at that level so that we can promote more systems change. So I was recently recruited to apply to be on the um, board of directors for the Arizona Center for Disability Law. So I applied and I was interviewed and I was unanimously voted on as a board member. So that is just new, (laughs) just started, um, you know, just this month. And Mateo also um, just last month was, um, he was recruited as well because we didn't like seek out these positions. They kind of found us but they wanted native representation. Um, I guess there was a native board member on the Arizona Developmental Disability Planning Council and her term was expiring. And so they wanted another um, board member, a native board member to replace her. And so um, Melissa, who we mentioned at the beginning of this interview referred um, or recommended Mateo for that position. And so he filled out the application and he submitted his letters of recommendation, and he got his background check because you have to be appointed by the governor, Governor Ducey, um, to be on the Arizona Developmental Disability Planning Council. So that all took several months. And so um, he just got his letter last, um, a couple weeks ago, you know, informing him that, you know, he's completed the process and he is now on, you know, a board member for that organization. So our terms on our different boards both are uh, like two or three years long. And so we're hoping that we can, you know, kind of help build awareness and start, you know, taking some action steps to 
you know, make system changes to hopefully make it easier for Native people, well, people in Native communities, you know, and also in just in the urban area, because there are a lot of um, Natives in the Phoenix urban area, you know, for people with disabilities to receive, you know, the services and the support that they need. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. The so Mateo's on the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, and you're on the Arizona Center. What's the rest of the name? For Disability Law, ACDL. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so representation is super important for both people with disabilities and for the Native community. And when you have that intersectionality, like you could really do a lot of uh, awareness. Right. We're hoping that, you know, not just awareness, but actually some action <laughs> after they become aware. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Mateo, again, do you have anything to add uh, to this question? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, truly, it's just, it's one of those things of, you know, you think that, the, you know, well, <laughs> all, you know, state, federal, tribal government, you know, you know, they, I'm pretty sure they want similar goals. It's just one of those things of, you know, they're just not communicating at all with each other. And I think that one of the things that, um, you know, one of the, you know, I think it's just, um, okay. Well, a suggestion or a recommendation that I think would probably be helpful is, just you know <clears throat> it is really getting some youth involved because I think a lot of times when uh, <laughs> I think with communication in general um, you get these <laughs> the you know these older people that kind of like you know I like read it into the <laughs> positions and you know it happens both in tribal community you know in tribal community state and you know federal and they think they know everything but they don't you know yeah. and you know sometimes it's not necessarily their fault sometimes it is it's just you know I think there's just needs to be a lot more rotation and a lot more like listening to to people and not being so stuck in in ways or sometimes even tradition in order to you know help people. Yeah, I agree um, with what Mateo's saying because I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, state and federal um, systems are set up, you know, around the adult voice and they totally exclude the youth voice. And I feel like the youth are very wise. You know, they have a lot of internal wisdom that hasn't been, you know, corrupted by, you know, adult ways of thinking or adult systems yet. And I feel like it's important to nurture that and to hear it and to act on it. And it's such a different world now than when the older people were young. So the youth voice is particularly <laughs> relevant. So true. Good point. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, with that being said, do you know if there are any um, youth groups that are specifically for like American Indians? youth with disabilities? No, but that is 
Yeah, that definitely needs to happen. Yeah, because yeah, I think um, that was in earlier talks with uh, during this project, that was one of the ideas was to bring more youth in on this project. And when I looked, I couldn't find any like youth groups that did um, that had this particular the I don't want to say theme. Focus. Yeah, focus. focus. Thank yeah. you. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, because you know all of the tribal communities they have like their youth councils. Um, because one of my jobs was I was the youth council advisor or coordinator for the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. And, um, you know, so they, they have an active youth council, but there is not an active youth, you know, organization for native youth with disabilities. So we'll put that on our list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to drop an idea in there. So if the, the tribes yeah. all have a youth council, then it could be the job of the youth council to make sure one of their members is a person with a disability. And then those, each of those individuals could then be on a nationwide, or at least nominated through a nationwide youth council. And it could fall, up, fall under the National Congress of, uh, what is that called? The National Congress of Indian? Oh. Yeah, NCAI. Yeah, of American yes. Indians. Right, they could have a youth council. Oh yeah, council. because they already have that in place with their youth councils yeah that's I just, a great idea because they have a council they have a council for people with disabilities right i mean it, to start an organization from scratch is hard but if there's already an existing structure then you could uh create a space for for that particular voice and group yes that is an awesome idea Thanks for thinking of that. That is great. <laughs> well, it, I mean, thank you to Mateo for bringing it up that that the youth voice is missing. Um, so some of the suggestions or recommendation, recommendations I'm hearing from this conversation is um, communication needs to be worked on. Um, but also involving the youth into these discussions that talk about the adult viewpoint. Or about systems change. Yes. Yeah. 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 Acknowledging, like creating a space for the youth voice, you know, to, you know, not just like, you know, being patronizing and patting them on the head and saying, okay, you know, thanks for saying a couple of, of things, and now we'll just proceed with how we've always done things. Nothing like that, but actually, you know, creating a space for them to be authentically heard and for action to be taken from their input, for their input to be, you know, equally valued, um, you know, along with the adult input. You know, the communication because structure on how to really empower youth voice exists with the, with the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum. If you used that model, uh, right. then you would not only be hearing youth voice, but you'd be empowering the youth. That's true. Um, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question, which is the last question. Um, so what is one positive action event activity that you see happening in the AIA and disability community currently happening? Okay. Already talked about so, um, well, one thing that I know is the um, there's the American Indian Disability Summit in uh, the Phoenix area, um, and they <laughs> uh, 
they recognize, you know, um, work that has been done uh, in the disability community and they avoid people every year. They have their own, uh, their own award that they give out. But there's a, um, <laughs> my mom actually was uh, instrumental in uh, creating a youth track because uh, she saw that there was a a definite need for uh, youth because prior to, what was it, 2017? Yeah, 2017, there was no actual youth that uh, won that uh, award. Um, <coughs> and then after, you know, <clears throat> so that that's one thing that oh, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh so uh the youth that had won that award was actually me uh, in twenty seventeen and then another youth in twenty eight uh twenty nineteen um had also yeah, twenty nineteen. Anya? Yeah. 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 Okay. Anya uh at that time, oh, what's the last thing? Anyway, Korea. At that time, Korea um, had won it, uh, who has avoided it. So, but she thought that there was a need for just youth engagement in general. And she created a, a youth track to help, um, to help the youth find ideas and uh, and you know be awarded so that you know they're not competing with the the adults so. yeah well so the American Indian Disability Summit which Mateo is telling you about it it um, started wow about what almost 20 years ago and here in Phoenix and it was because they, they did a talking circle and they realized there was a need for um, to have a yearly summit for, you know, urban natives with disabilities. And so they, you know, held it every year, got their own funding. Um, it grew and, you know, it was good for and it was really um, geared toward the adult population with disabilities. So then um, after Mateo, so the yearly award, because the. Um, founder of the event was Marcus Harrison Jr. And um, he passed away several years ago, but they put a, or created an award um, in his honor. So it's the name of the award is the Marcus Harrison Jr. Leadership Award. And so it's for a person, you know, who is a leader in the disability, Native American disability community. So um, up until 2017, um, it had been given to adults. So Mateo was nominated by a voc rehab counselor um, at the state level. And then he, they ended up selecting him that year as the recipient of that award. And so then the next year I realized, because when I attended it that year, I realized that there were, there were adults in attendance, but there were also youth. But the youth were kind of just tagging along with their adults, <laughs> you know, the parents going to the adult um, subject, you know, subject matter um, workshops. And so I thought, okay, we need to solve this because, you know, the youth have a different focus and different needs and just even how you, the type of workshop that you're presenting should be different. The presentation format should be different for youth. So I expressed to the committee that there should be a youth track. And so then that's what started um, them offering, you know, a specific block of um, programming for the youth. So then this year, and then the pandemic hit. Um, so this year, what they did is they had it on two different days. So there was one that was for the adult, you know, workshops, and then there was another day for the youth workshops. So hopefully it can be back to in-person soon and, you know, it can resume and progress, you know, and continue to to um, grow. So that's what Mateo was telling you about. We feel like that's a valuable, um, you know, a valuable event that happens in the community and it's well attended. Um, and it's, you know, 
it's been sustained over time. So it's it's a good, you know, it's a good service to the American Indian disability community here in Phoenix. The um, the one positive activity that I wanted to share with you about um, the Native community currently happening is the University of Arizona in Tucson has the Sonoran University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. So I found out more about them this last um, spring. I think it was like April or May. And I started um, communicating and collaborating with them. And um, we were able to start some specific, because I expressed to them that, you know, the main problem that we're experiencing in Gila River is that there are no no services offered like in the community, physically in the community. Like the tribal members with disabilities always have to go off the community to get what they need. So I said, it would be great if we had more, you know, services that were offered right here um, and were easier to access. So the university, um, the Sonoran you said, staff members, were very receptive and accommodating. And they started, um, they already had an existing program called the Transition Ahead Roundtables. And so it's a day long event where a youth and their parent or guardian um, provide, are provided with um, training from all different kinds of adult service providers, agencies, programs, et cetera, um, to help the youth you know, realize what's available for them after they get out of high school. So we've done several of these now with, and I had them actually come to the community to do these events. So within Heal River, there's seven different geographical districts that the um, tribal lands are divided into. And so each district has a community service center. So they are like a big building. A lot of them are new, they, they're beautiful. And that's kind of like the hub of where the people who live in the districts, you know, congregate, receive services, et cetera. They have like a, a pool, a gym, workout room, um, walking track, classrooms, uh, meeting rooms, art rooms, et cetera, computer lab, all of that. So um, I had, I um, scheduled those to happen in the districts where the community member student with a disability lived. And so their parents attended those over the summer and into the fall. And they've been, you know, very successful, very helpful. You know, the parents have been, you know, so, um, you know, appreciative and grateful of being able to learn about all of that information, you know, in one day, in one location. So I think that that's a good model you know, that needs to be replicated more um, throughout, because it's, you know, it's successful, you know, throughout Indian country, because, you know, there's other, you know, native communities that are rural. And so, you know, this would be a, um, a replicable model to provide, you know, um, efficient, effective services to transition age youth in those communities as well. So, but the other thing that the University of Arizona Sonoran You Said Center um, is providing is, well, actually they wrote a grant recently and they included us, Gila River. So we wrote a support letter to their grant and um, the grant was awarded to the U of A. And so it's a, what it's for is culturally um, based transition services for youth to get them into competitive employment opportunities. So right there in the community. So I'm so excited for that to start. Um, you know, it was just awarded just this month. So we're still in the like the planning stages, preliminary planning stages to figure out how this is gonna roll out. But one of the um, cultural practices that they are going to be using, utilizing is talking circles. Um, I feel like, you know, there's so much, you know, so much cultural teaching and cultural reinforcement of respectful communication within the talking circle environment that I feel like that's going to be an effective tool to implement this, you know, the grant services. And then also, you know, a third thing that the Sonoran you said is providing is 
there is a um, there's a charter school called Skyline Gila River, and it is um, located just like what half a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile outside of the community in Chandler. And so a lot of our students go there because they it's they offer high school classes there. So, and remember how I said that there's no high schools within Gila River community. So all the kids have to go outside of the community to go to high school. So it's, it's located close, you know, to the community. And a lot of the students, like what, 98% of the students that go there are from Gila River. And be, but because they're a charter school, they don't have a big special education department with the funding that, um, you know, a public school with a special ed department would have. So um, I suggested that we meet with Skyline Gila River and see if we could, you know, work with their students, their, especially their transition aid students, to provide, you know, more like supplemental or enhanced transition services because we know they don't have the funding to do that. And so we've had a couple meetings with the principal and their special ed, you know, teacher, and they said, yes, let's do this because <laughs> they realized they need that assistance and support as well. So that's another pro, um, another service that is moving forward. And so univer the U of A is hiring a vocational specialist to work directly at that school and provide work-based learning experiences um, for the students. So, which are volunteer for the students. So the student is going out, but they're actually getting some workforce um, experience working in actual businesses. So that's all being set up by the University of Arizona, just through the collaborative efforts of, of myself and them listening to what the need was in the community and, you know, implementing their programs and services that they already have in place to serve Native students, you know, close to their home communities. So I think that's definitely a positive, you know, positive things that are happening, you know, that are being provided by the University of Arizona. Sonoran, you said. It's, uh, oh, it's okay. You said, I know what it is. Yeah. You are, I get the you name are a force. Familiar. You're a force. Look at all the places what? you've had influence. I mean, with the oh. award at the, for youth at the American American Indian Disability Summit. I mean, we could I could go back through my notes, but good for you. Thank you. Well, it's just, but it's also people are listening, you know. Um, it's so it's they're the other half of making it happen. <laughs> yeah. Wow. These I'm I'm glad to hear that um, these events are happening and that people are listening. Um, yeah, do you guys have anything else you'd like to say or add to our discussion overall? Um, well, not, probably not content wise, but I just wanted to say, you know, thanks to both of you for, you know, sharing your time with us this afternoon, um, <laughs> you know, working through the technology issues because they're always there. And, um, you know, for taking the time and effort to, you know, interview not only us, but everybody else that you've, you know, spent time interviewing, you know, and for caring, you know, about the issues that are currently facing people with, you know, Native people with disabilities. So thank you for all of that. Wow, it's all, it's all you. Like, I mean, like, we're, you're telling us what to do. You're, no, thank you to you for allowing us to come in and just pick your brains about these questions. Yes. We're, we're yeah, well, it's been beneficial to us too, you know, because just having the conversation, you know, has created a lot of, you know, I've been taking notes about the next steps that I'm going to be taking to create positive change. But, you know, my notes wouldn't have happened unless we had this conversation. <laughs> well, you have, like you mentioned earlier, you have the warrior spirit. I'm not surprised you take <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have my answers to thank for that. <laughs> it's it's been a joy to listen to what both of you have um, have done and contributed. It's been very 
interesting and witnessed and uh, not you know the bullying and such i mean it's important to know that that exists too right yeah well and there's so much more to do yeah <laughs> okay. all right well i think this is the end of this um again thank you so much for sitting down with us and answering a couple of questions Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good Have rest a good of day. your day. All right. Thanks. All right. See Bye. you.